Hello and welcome to Frank Fridays. My name is Carlina Moeller and I am the founder of Art Frankly. I'd like to introduce to you my co-collaborator for Frank Fridays, Ellie Hayworth of Hayworth Communications Consultancy. Ellie is committed to promoting intrepid ideas in both art and design, and she has grown her business to command a full scope of client services, including speaking engagements, public relations, business strategy and development, you name it, Ellie can help. And today we're really excited because we are chatting with Allison Yearwood. Allison is the executive director of Plugin ICA, Canada's only institute of contemporary art. Plugin is located in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Previously, Allison was the program manager of the Indigenous Arts Department at the Banff Center. Allison advocates for racialized and disenfranchised groups to decolonize institutions of power from the ground up. She is exceptionally skilled on issues of equity and is a powerful and transformative voice for anti-racism action. We are thrilled to have Allison here with us today. So I'll let Ellie get us started. Amazing. Thank you, Carlina. And Allison, it's really lovely to chat with you today. You as well. <laughs> This will be fun. So Allison, as I was prepping for our conversation today, I was revisiting your original Frank talk. And I think just first and foremost, you were kind of reminiscing and or acknowledging the fact that, you know, you've built a really unique career for yourself. You weren't following a specific career trajectory. And I think this is something that um, is somewhat consistent across a number of the entrepreneurs in the arts that we've spoken with. So maybe you can just kind of paint a picture of kind of your journey to art and, and a bit about your career. Yeah, oh my gosh, that is so true. Um, I, I feel like right now I'm meeting so many other black unicorns um, because it's like, oh my gosh, you're out here too and you're magical and you've been just doing all of this amazing like projects and amazing work and you've been doing it over there and it just it's always been over there and I think this moment if there's anything that can we can just gleam out of just this kind of nightmare scope we're all living in I, I just have to really acknowledge it's been so galvanizing just being able to connect to other racialized and disenfranchised um, creatives and art producers and art doulas and art agitators and mm -hmm. artists and curators um, and just realize that I'm not like I think that's the one thing that I felt when I was starting out on my journey was like, oh, I'm not going to be an art person because like, I'm not austere. I'm not elitist. I'm not fancy. I'm not hoity toity. And it felt very over there being in the arts, even though, you know, low key, I was totally like designing a career in the arts. Mm -hmm. It was like, I, I think for so much of my career, I was thinking I was outside of the arts because I didn't come with the beautiful diplomas and the MFAs and all of the kind of what feels formalized and the kind of right way, quote unquote, to do things. I think what, well, how I just kind of kept just working really hard and really consistently and people really saw like, oh my gosh, she's really good at um, working with indigenous people or, you know, she's really good at conflict and not just shirking it um, mm -hmm. or she's really got high standards in her aesthetic eye. And I, I just kept at it in all of my roles, regardless if I was a program coordinator when I was, you know, working at, you know, Urban Shaman or starting out in my first role at the BAM Center, all the way to when I get, you know, a little bit more, you know, uh, you know, official in my career trajectory and, you know, become the art and business manager at Yamaji Art and, you know, start talking to roomfuls of, you know, NASA scientists on, you know, Australian Aboriginal sky stories because there's an intersection between, you know, NASA science and artistic integrity, <laughs> culturally speaking, from Aboriginal Australians. And just to kind of fuse that what feels what, to the rest of us that feels so like, oh, those are really obtuse and really like, come on, that doesn't make no sense. But it does make some sense. It, like really the science of our planet made sense to indigenous Australians because mm. how do you think they figured out how to farm or 
when it was good land or where to live and where to hunt. Like that all relates to our hoity-toity, you know, fanciness of engineering or agriculture. And I think if I can just like distill anything to a young person, it would just be like, don't look at where you are as like low or not valuable because every little piece of that puzzle gets you to like the big stakes. And I mean, mm -hmm. I look back at it now and I go, thank God I was naive and dumb in some of those little, <laughs> some of those roles because I risked so much then and it propelled me here. Because yeah. if I wasn't risking going, hey, let me work with Indigenous Canadians because that's authentically who I galvanized towards, who I authentically felt this is a story that resonates with me versus, oh, let me do something that's going to get me clout or get me a really mm -hmm. cool job um, or it's going to brand me really well. I think the reason why um, it all now makes sense at this level of my career is because it was all making sense in how I was learning about it. Like I authentically made relationships. I authentically lived um, in community. I authentically worked with artists. I authentically sat with elders. I authentically got told stories. So you don't like none of what happens now in terms of when people come for me or when, you know, you get those nice little call outs. It doesn't feel so like, oh, because it's, it's, I know my stuff. I, I, yeah, I've done you've earned little it. learning blocks. Yeah, yeah, you know, I took my time and it takes time. Like, and I think that's the one thing that irritates you when you're younger is having to bite the bullet that this is going to take time. It's like, um, you want to just get there. You're just like, no, but I'm so good now. I'm so smart right. now. I know everything now. And it's like, no, you really don't. And I'm so glad life kind of slows you down a little bit because it's those lessons, it's those roles, it's those places, it's, it's those relationships that really get you ready for like, get you ready for your, your, your present. And I'm like, yeah. Ooh, thank you. All of the communities that dedicated and put some investment time into me, yeah. because yeah. I hope right now you're going to bear your fruit. I hope right now that I'm an executive director, that I'm a, a chair of a arts board that I'm a member at large that I'm on an equity committee I hope now those things are going to make the movements make the things that we want to mm. see happen happen you know because the investment came into me so oh my god I hope that answered your question 20 hours ago that you asked <laughs> no it was great and I think you know it really is the art world specifically is about relationships but I think the world at large is about relationships and so I think this investment in building relationships, learning from your peers, and also kind of investing in community. I think those are all some key kind of key tenets that are career building, but also character building. And so all of that I think rings true with, with what you just relayed. Um, you have matriculated into a really spectacular role. And I think while you speak very proudly about all of your different roles, you were the Treaty One Plug-In ICA's first ever Black Executive Director. And I'm hoping that maybe you can unpack for all of us a little bit of what those roles and responsibilities are. Yeah, that, you know what? It, it's, it really is such a beautiful honor to be back because I am actually from Treaty One, otherwise known as Winnipeg. Um, and it's really um, something that I feel really special about because mm -hmm. I know the communities, the OG Cree, the Cree, the Dene, the Lakota, you know, the Anishinaabe, those are my friends and, and being on Métis homeland as well. Like it's, that's the history that I've grown up with and it, to infuse it with my own ethnic heritage of being a mm -hmm. black woman and understanding that I'm a stolen person on stolen land and using that um informed lens of like reconciliation which is so important as like Canadians and and our responsibility for care for living on land that hasn't really authentically been um provided to or provided mm -hmm. with and the fact that we benefit off of it so um understanding that kind of tenant of care is kind of how I approach kind of where I come from being a black leader in that space is that I come from the lens of understanding what it means like to have something taken away from you, what it feels like to not be heard, what it feels like to feel like 
your story was interrupted and another history was supplanted on. And I understand all of those commonalities of mm -hmm. the First Nation land that I live on. And so I think it gives me a unique um, bit of respect and influence mm -hmm. and um, just perspective guidance in terms of how am I going to steer this very influential organization that deals with contemporary art, meaning that we research, we disseminate, we produce, we <laughs> make publications, and that, and we exhibit, and we um, also invest in new artists. We also invest in our mid and senior level artists. We travel, and we do all of those activities. And I think in the responsibility of those activities and in the joy of being able to perform those activities, we have to also acknowledge the responsibility and, and have to acknowledge that we are part of the network and the fabric of our community. And that comes with the responsibility. And I think that's the lens that I bring to my <laughs> leadership um, is the kind of community lens, that kind of Let's bring it back to, is everyone at this table being heard in the way that mm -hmm. they need to be heard? Not saying that everyone's gonna be heard all the time and in the same way, but meaning are the people that we're bringing to this table, the ones that we should be bringing, the one, are we, are we feeding them all of the good food? Is it a healthy food? Should we bring more food? You know, do we need, you know and it's all of those wonderful things and I'm not, and that's not to poo poo what's come before because what's come before has gotten us to the specific space. Are there issues with certain aspects of it? Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> but I don't, throw, I don't believe personally that you throw the baby out with the bathwater. I do think that there has to be some investigation and interrogation of, okay, um, there are some problematic things in the way that things have been done or ha have historically been seen. There's some icky things that we're not all kind of grappling with. And in that, can we bring in some other ways? Can we hold other things? And I feel like really the community at large, especially um, now that I've kind of come in as a, a leader for the last like eight months in my role, I, I feel like that's what people have been asking for me. That's what the community mm -hmm. has been asking for me is to kind of assist in that kind of, how do we do this in an authentically um, conscientious way? How do we do this by keeping the integrity of the profile of the work still where it is? How do we do it in a way that honors the land that we're on, you know, in, you know, spiritually, environmentally, and, and fiscally, unfortunately, <laughs> in some people's way, <laughs> you know, but you got to keep the lights on, <laughs> but, you know, but um, I think that's really what I bring to the table through my, my landscape or my lens. Yeah. I think that's amazing. I'm also just curious. I think a lot of our audience members are, you know, they're American or they're international in scope. And so some of us, I personally haven't been to Winnipeg. I'm curious, can you maybe just speak a little bit about the arts community and the community at large in Winnipeg so that we can paint a picture of, you know, of just the community? Yeah, okay, so Winnipeg. Um, Winnipeg is not gonna win any um, competitions for being Canada's prettiest city. That's not, <laughs> yeah, that's not the Canada that we, yeah, we're not the ones that the postcards are about. Yeah, we're not your Mounties, we're not the West Coast, we're not the Maritimes. Um, we do share a lot of the great things about all of the regions in Canada. Like we're the um, second largest French speaking population outside of Quebec. I think most people when they think like, really? Manitoba, Winnipeg, what? Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you know, beaucoup français. <laughs> I love that, and, I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> who, right, who knew? And you know, we are, we're this kind of agricultural community that has like world-class arts. And it's, it's kind of, people don't really think of, when you think of arts, you don't necessarily think of Winnipeg, but you have to understand like our geography creates a really unique benefit for us. When it is minus 40 and below, um, I'm not sure what the transversion for the American uh, weather, but just it's freaking cold. Um, so when <laughs> yes. it's like freaking cold, 
for eight months of your year, you yeah. end up incubating and you end up, you know, figuring out other things to do. Mm -hmm. And we, I guess what we ended up all doing was just becoming world-class at whatever art form we are. So we've got world-class symphony, world-class opera, world-class filmmaking, world-class animation, yeah, world-class visual art, world-class dance. Like our ballet sticks it to the national ballet by, call, by calling itself, you know, the Royal National Ballet. It's like, <laughs> yeah, there might be one in Ottawa, but we're the one that the queen and everybody else really likes, you know? And to me, that is so Winnipeg. It's so Winnipeg to be like, oh yeah, the best one's here, but whatever, we're not going to be like, you know, in your face about it, but we'll be tongue in cheek about it. Yeah. Like we have so many Grammy award winners, Oscar winners. And when people right. are like, really? In Winnipeg? It's like, yeah, because it takes a lot of things to make music and film and other things. It's not just the one name at the end it's all of the you know supporting roles that go into the piece of work you know like when the oscars happen how many people are winning animation cinematography awards in winnipeg it's because we've got amazing production houses That's right really right. And, yeah and because we're also highly multicultural we tend to be intersectional with our culture which creates this hybridity of like aesthetics that you know really when you put it into the visual art world you put it into the you know dance art world you put it into film it becomes something onto itself that the world wants to play with and wants to see right so when you come to Winnipeg, you meet this kind of community of everyone from everywhere uh, in the middle of this flatland prairie land that's freezing ice cold for a lot of the time and then blazing hot with mosquitoes. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> really, um, you come to a downtown core that has nothing but dollar stores but also um, a West Broadway um, community that has mm -hmm. every single culture on the planet's mm -hmm. top rated food. Um, I guess amazing. Winnipeg, yeah, Winnipeg could just be a place of contradictions, but world-class contradictions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but it seems, it seems like it's in and of itself, just it's inherently a highly cultural place. And so you're kind of energized at all turns by, both the challenge of learning about new, you know, new cultures and new people, but also, you know, how you kind of identify within a framework of a very interesting and kind of hybrid approach. So I don't know, that sounds, that's really, it's great to kind of paint that picture. Um, Allison, we, so we love to kind of round out here at Art Frankly with some professional practice questions. And, you know, we always talk about kind of professional best practices. And I think specifically just considering your expertise in, you know, creating safe spaces for marginalized communities um, in decolonizing institutions from within, what are some best practices that you would relay to kind of the next generation or this generation? I mean, I think we're, we're doing it right now, but just what are some best practices? Um, you know, be nice in your questioning, be nice in your response. I understand mm -hmm. that we all have unique experiences and perspectives that, you know, inhibit us or exhibit us to, to propel us to do more or to do less, depending on where we fall on the pendulum. But I do think if we could just be kind, like you could just be kind by saying, you know what? that's a little bit too much for me to process or you're offering me too much than I can share or that I can contribute. Mm. Do you mind going elsewhere for your needs? And, and, and I think if you just offer it in that way versus, no, there's Google. No, no, I, I totally, I totally agree. And I think certainly holding space for, for compassion and, you know, I like your point about silence, but then on the flip side, there's so much noise especially when it comes to the fact that we're all living in like digital platforms these days that I do think, I don't know, there have been so many emails that are just better, better directed as a phone call. You're also building a relationship in a way that you would not be if you were just having an email correspondence with someone. So I think all of those are really essential best practices to be imparting to the next generation. 
I think that's quite Absolutely. wise. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you wouldn't send an email to an elder. You would have a conversation to an elder. So I just think like there's a reason why some of these good old practices like oral history gets held on for so yeah. long. It's because it's good. It's just good. Yeah. 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 Things that are good are good. I agree. I agree. Um, Allison, uh, just our kind of favorite concluding question, we're rounding out of what has been a very volatile year and clearly something that, you know, we as an arts community have seen, uh, it's, it's affected us in ways that I think is kind of incomparable to other industries. Um, not to say that everybody hasn't been affected equally, but I'm curious, you know, if we were to look at one positive takeaway in terms of what has um, come out of the pandemic, what has come out of the social movements that we've seen over the course of the past 12 to 16 months, what is one positive takeaway that you want to hold close to the best? You know what, I think through all of this in what has felt like I said earlier, like a nightmare trope, I think what's been really <laughs> nice and I think we're going to, I think this is what we should hold on to is our demystification of our needs for mental health I think yeah. through all of this we've been all of us have been so gentle with each other about our needs to take less screen time that we need we need to be around each other we need human interaction we need to be you know we need to have relationships with each mm -hmm. other we need to be around each other we need to celebrate with each other we need to scream at each other and I think that has just really made me go, okay, how do we hold mental health care and awareness at the forefront now? Now that we've made it so omnipresent and mm -hmm. so like, you know, our workplaces are going, are you having check-ins? Are you okay? Do you need to take a step back? Mm -hmm. We weren't hearing that from employers a year ago, even like we weren't hearing those kind of like, be gentle with yourself, you know, step away from your computer screen, you know, you know, be, ma be mindful of, you know, your space, be mindful of what you say. We weren't having those kind of conversations. So, and I think, if we can pull anything through from the other side, because we're going to want to do a lot of regressing. This was really painful for a lot of us. We're not going to want to remember and try to bring through a lot of all of this. I think for a lot of us, the word mask, quarantine, pandemic are going to be stricken from the English vernacular for many years to come. But I also think if we can keep hold of Let's be honest with each other. Let's make space for these mental health issues. Let's be honest that everyone has mental health mm -hmm. and therefore we have to manage it, be responsible for it, make space for it, have words and um, syntax for people to express what they need. We need supports for it. We need a space for it. And I think for me, in, in and if I can do anything in how I lead, I think I'll try to do things and to manage things in a more mentally health conscious way and and try to see how that serves us because mm -hmm. I think mental health has been the thing that's been tried really hard during this pandemic but I think it's also been one of those things that have served so many of us through it and having good supports has been really important yeah it's actually apropos that you say that I think we're just rounding out on mental health awareness month um I think the month of May if I'm understanding correctly is the mental health awareness month and okay. I you know I think it's something that needs to be not necessarily you know siloed in a month I think we need to kind of have active reminders that you know Absolutely. We're not all rushing, you know, life is a journey. We're not all rushing to the end point. And so if you need to take time for yourself, that's going to be the best way to actually build longevity and, and posterity. So I think that's a, mm -hmm. that's a beautiful Absolutely. note to end on. Thanks. Language. Yeah. So Allison, this has been really lovely. I wish we could continue to talk. We are rounding out at the end of our Frank Friday, but I just, it's really nice to know you. And I, I I've had such a fun time chatting. You too. Thank you so much for speaking to me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. And likewise.